program. Uh, first, I'll ask Mike to come to the podium uh, and read from his work and talk with you some about the craft of reporting and writing. Uh, and when he finishes, he'll be joined on stage by our moderator, uh, and they will have a conversation. But I'd like for you to be thinking of your questions uh, to ask of Mike, and then uh, they will go to, to you, the audience, for your Q&A. So be thinking of your questions. Now our moderator is Ann Gerhardt, and she's a special moderator for several reasons. I'm just going to list a few of them. First of all, uh, she's one of the top editors of the Washington Post. And second, she's a graduate of Penn State, journalism graduate. And third, she is herself a distinguished writer uh, who appeared on our program uh, 13 years ago. Uh, and this is our first husband-wife uh, team uh, in our Distinguished Writers Conference. And oh, I should also mention that she's the wife of Michael Sokolov. So um, I'm proud now to present Michael Sokolov and Ann Gerhardt. Uh, and I'm also uh, now welcome Mike to the podium. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, thank you for having me, and, and thank you to Gene Foreman for inviting me. It's an enormous privilege uh, to be at a conference that, that, that is named for Gene. Uh, I worked with Gene in Philadelphia, and uh, it's just a great thing, and I'm very honored. Uh, the other great thing is to be invited to a university to speak. Uh, I always like that because as journalists, uh, we're always inside a story. Uh, we're inside a book, whatever the project is, and whoops, there's you know there's no time to look forward, uh, no time to look back, you, and you know this is always an opportunity to think about what I do and why I do it. So if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I'm going to tell you a story about luck and why it's in this business. Luck, you know, matters a little bit as it does in other businesses. Uh, but maybe more so when you're a reporter. It helps to be in the right place at the right time. You can't always control that. My very first day in this business as a real newspaper reporter, uh, I was 20 years old and I was an intern at a place called the Bucks County Courier Times. And my job that first day on a Saturday uh, was to sort of listen to the police radio, which we called the Squawk Box. and. Uh, go cover news if it occurred, but of course no news really ever broke in this place. But on this day, we got, you know, we, or this scratchy police radio, we got a report that someone was shot about a quarter mile from the, uh, news, from the newsroom. So they said, Sokolov, go out and, and see what's going on. And I got there very quickly and I got there before the police got there. And I saw an elderly man in a, in a sort of a uniform, but more like a Boy Scout uniform. And I said, what happened? Uh, we got this report. And he said, I just shot a man. I said, really? And uh, I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I'm a deputy fish warden. And there were some people riding through the park, uh, some young men. And one of them threw a beer bottle out, uh, out the car. And uh, they wouldn't stop, so I shot him and I killed him. I said, OK. And I asked, the I asked the deputy fish warden what his name was. And he said, William Fish. And, uh, you know, I had really good, proper uh, journalism training at that point, so I asked him how he spelled his name, and I, I got the spelling of his name, and the police came, and they quickly shooed me away, uh, and I went back to, to the newsroom, and I told them what had happened, and they looked at me like they had just hired some kind of lunatic. Uh, because, and I said, no, 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 and I showed them my notebook, and I think I probably said, here it is, F-I-S-H, here's the man's name, and uh, the next day in, in the newspaper, uh, after I think my editors checked up on me with the police and made sure this really happened the way I said it, there was a headline that said, Fish Warden, colon, I shot him. So that was my first day in the business. Uh, and I think it demonstrated that, you know, you, you, you need some luck and you need to, uh, of course, be able to respond to your luck and, and produce something. So this book that I wrote, um, Drama High, and I have to read the subtitle because it's such a long subtitle, as happens these days, I have to actually read it or I mess it up. It's called Drama High, The Incredible True Story of a Brilliant Teacher, a Struggling Town, and the Magic of Theater. And to some extent, it's not a, it's not a function of luck, but it's a function of happenstance. 
because uh, this was my hometown, and this was my teacher, and this was my mentor, and this you know, was that one inspiring teacher that all of us need in our lives to get somewhere, and there's almost no one who's ever gotten anywhere in life that can't point to that one teacher, and this, this was mine, but I felt very strongly that um, this is not a love letter to a teacher, it's not sentimental, um, but also that I, as you know, and that any writer uh, could have written a serious nonfiction book on this man and this town and this theater program, which is an example of you know astonishing success in an unlikely place, because this is a very much a down on its luck town uh, where he runs probably the best theater program, the best high school theater program in America. So I was obviously able to bring something different to this story because this was a, a person I knew and was deeply important to me, and this was my hometown. So I'm gonna read you uh, a small passage of this book. The, the background is, it's the moment that Cameron McIntosh, who is the, the biggest man in theater, and he's someone uh, you know, in New York, in London, you know, he's, in a, he's he, he, all these plays in New York, you know, it's Cameron McIntosh, and he took an interest in this theater program and began to use it to pilot high school plays and see if they would work. So this is the day that Cameron McIntosh comes to Truman High School. On a mid-November afternoon in 2001, a black stretch limousine set out from Manhattan, passed through the Lincoln Tunnel, and headed south for 50 miles on the New Jersey Turnpike before crossing over the Delaware River and into Pennsylvania. Among its passengers and the person for whom the trip had been organized was Cameron McIntosh, the West End and Broadway producer of Cats, The Phantom of the Opera, and Miss Saigon, blockbusters that grossed hundreds of millions of dollars and afforded the producer a lavish jet-setting lifestyle. He split his time between his apartments in London and New York, farmhouse in Provence, seaside home in Malta, and 15,000 acre estate in the Scottish Highlands. Queen Elizabeth knighted him on New Year's Day, 1996, for contributions to musical theater. Cameron McIntosh was headed to Levittown, Pennsylvania, and Truman High for a Lou Volpe production. McIntosh's traveling companions, business associates who had arranged this excursion, had fervent hopes for its success, but many were uneasy. It was once written of McIntosh, his gut is famous meaning that he knows what he likes and what he doesn't and how to make that known. By the measures that seem to matter most, Truman High is at best second rate. Its students do not excel at standardized tests and few of them ever go off to Ivy League colleges or other prestigious institutions, unless you put the US military in that category. The school sends plenty of its graduates straight into the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. The neighborhoods it serves, I'm sorry, the neighborhoods it draws from are often called blue collar but that is an outdated notion, one based on steady union jobs at U.S. Steel and other nearby industrial giants that are two decades gone. Parents of Truman students work at warehouses and call centers, and some supplement their incomes with shifts at fast food restaurants. When Truman makes news, it's usually for the wrong reasons, like when the class president couldn't give his graduation speech and an empty chair was put in his place because he was the target of a gang hit and no one wanted gunfire at commencement. In the local lexicon, Truman High, an otherwise prosperous Bucks County, is on the wrong side of Route 1. It's where you do not want to be and where you'd leave if you hit the lottery. The high school has one principal mark of distinction, Volpe's astoundingly successful drama program. Younger students know of him long before they reach Truman and hope to one day be in his shows. He's like a winning football coach in some down-on-his-luck Ohio or Texas town a beacon, a sign that grand achievement is possible, albeit unlikely. Schools with vastly greater financial resources boasting higher achieving students born to wealthier parents cannot match the quality and accomplishments of Truman High, of Truman Drama. No high school in America can. As the limousine approached Truman, it passed by a factory complex, the old 3M plant, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. It is now called the Bristol Commerce Center, the sort of Orwellian name given to a place where commerce has ceased to exist. No cars were in the vast parking lot. No cars are ever in the lot. Out to the left side of the road was Bloomsdale, a ramshackle, all-black enclave that its residents, employing an advanced sense of irony, had long called Hollywood. 
McIntosh and his entourage were now entering Levittown proper, the post-war co suburban colossus. The town's main intersection, called Five Points, is dotted with check cashing agencies and pawn shops. Most of the 17,000 homes mass produced by developer William Levitt are still standing in defiance of predictions that the tiki tacky structures would not last, but many are in need of a new roof and a coat of paint. Levittown has never been a pretty place, even in its best days. It is a suburban prairie, an expanse of flat terrain once farmed for potatoes before it was planted with house upon house and little else. At the intersection of Green Lane and Mill Creek Road, the limo turned into the Truman parking lot and was directed into the spot closest to the front door, the principal space. A sort of pre-theater buffet, cold cuts and soft drinks, had been set out for McIntosh and his traveling party and the guidance office. Volpe scurried in briefly to make the famous producer, but he had a cast ready for a show and in any case was far too nervous to eat. As he would recall, I was delirious, I was hysterical. I thought, how am I going to make it through this night? I was running all around, trying to keep the kids calm, but they were fine. I was the one who was a mess. Some of the other teachers gamely made conversation with Macintosh, but the chasm was too vast. What were they going to say to him? How are things in Malta? So that is my reading. I think we now move into the, uh, the Q&A period. Thank you. Um, if I can move this up and shade it, I will try to project. Um, so our format is I will interrogate my husband, which he has said is a terrible thing to have to do in front of a public audience, to be interrogated by your own wife. And then I do urge you to take the opportunity as students of journalism to ask him questions about his craft or ask us questions about how we've managed to do the same thing kind of side by side for all these years or whatever you want to ask, but it's an opportunity for you to talk about this as well. Um, so you wrote four books, which in many ways were finely crafted explorations of failure, I would say. Um, three books, actually. The first one was on Pete Rose, who was the baseball player, uh, who was kicked out for gambling, and then you wrote about Daryl Strawberry and the Ticket Out, an examination of how sports does not really provide the pathway that we often think it will for kids who are in the inner city. Then you wrote about young women and the epidemic of injuries in their athletic careers, why they have ACLs that blow out at a rate greater than men, why they push on past their point of pain, in a way that men don't do and what we could learn from that. And so you had to be pushed to embrace a book which is essentially about success. And I'm wondering why that is and if you can talk about if that was, how that was hard for you. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a good question for, for journalists because you know I've trained in lots of ways uh, it's to write about things that are wrong when you get into the newspaper business. Uh, is this, is this, is that... Okay. Now? Okay. Um, when you get into the newspaper business, you know, you want to investigate. You want to find things that are wrong. You want to write about government wrongdoing. And, uh, and that's all really good and really important stuff. But I think that uh, partly maybe as a function of age, because the older I get, you know, I don't want to write about things all the time that are bummers. You know, that, but, but the other thing is you get a little older and you get a little wiser and you realize that success and, and joy and, uh, and, and things that work are part of the world and they need to be written about too. And not in a sentimental, sappy way, uh, but in a way that you take it, you know, from the inside out and you really examine success in the same way that you examine failure and find out why does this work? Uh, how does this man inspire children? Uh, how does this program inspire children? Uh, what does the study of drama, which I knew very little about, you know, how does that change a person's soul or, or, or access their soul, perhaps? And uh, so all of those things made me want to do this book. Uh, and I think partly because I was tired about writing about just failure. 
Was it challenging to take on a subject that, as you say, you knew very little about? You have not been Lou's drama student. He had wanted you to try out. You refused to do that because you were an athlete, and <coughs> athlete, athletic boys didn't try out for theater then. And so you had a range of comfort about understanding athleticism and competition, but this was not a part of high school world or any world you knew. Was that challenging? It was really challenging because I have written a lot about sports, and if I go um, to write about a basketball coach and I stand on the sideline and I watch his practice, uh, I feel pretty confident that I see more out of that practice than most people would see because I, I played sports, I've covered sports. You know, all watching is not equal. The more you see, the, the, the more you understand. And this was not that at all. But on the other hand, I feel like I embraced it because why else do we get in this business but to learn something new? And that's, you know, that is one of the great things about being in this business. You can show up and uh, long after your university learning is over, you can learn. And I feel like every story I do, especially since I've been uh, privileged enough to work in long form magazine writing and then books, you know, everything I do is giving myself a course. And, uh, it can be scary if you're, if you're taking that course and you haven't had the prerequisites, and I didn't for this one, but, uh, and, and some have said that that showed. I got one lovely review that, in the New York Times that, that, that just loved the book, but there was a little discernment in there that some of it was a little new to me. So you take a chance, but, uh, but that's a, that, that was a great uh, privilege to be able to do that. I remember that you went to a lot of rehearsals and went to a lot of classes that Lou taught. Michael had to actually go through a background check, criminal background check, <laughs> so that he could get his tag, which admitted him into the school district there, so he could attend the school. And sometimes you would say, uh, you know, I feel like I've seen so many of these shows, I've seen so many of these rehearsals, I really don't want to drive back up there, we live about three hours away. Um, but I really am afraid I'm going to miss something. I really think I should go. Can you talk a little bit about that feeling of continuing to go back and back and back because you may miss a great detail you don't have yet? Yes. I mean, I would say that, that in, in any kind, whether you're, whether you're writing a daily story uh, and your deadline is uh, at 7 o'clock and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to stay here until 5.30 and I'm going to write as fast and as well as I can because I want to see as much as I can or it's a magazine story or it's a book you know and and I consider what I did uh, not you know nonfiction immersion journalism and immersion means you immerse and you keep going and you keep going because you are afraid you're gonna miss something but also hopefully you love what you're seeing and um, I did love what I was seeing and there was a moment uh, and and also there there's an element of you want to become almost invisible as a writer. Uh, you want to be someone who is just sort of gotten into the background uh, so cleverly that, that people don't even realize you're there. And, uh, and things just go on as if you're not there and you're just observing, which is, you know, which is always a great goal. But I do remember at one point I followed um, these students to a state theater festival and um, I pulled up, it was on the other side of this state, it was almost to Ohio, it was a long drive, and I pulled up and the bus was there, and I was probably just a couple months into this project at this point. And they all started looking out the bus and saying, Mike's here, Mike's here, and they were pounding on the window, and I have to admit, uh, I really got a kick out of that, because I'm a guy uh, my age, in my 50s, my late 50s, and uh, these are a bunch of high school kids I'm writing about. So that was a little bit of something to conquer there. I mean, you have to make yourself as a writer uh, liked. You have, if you're going to be immersive, you have to make yourself someone who other people want to be around, and that comes from partly just being yourself, you know, be a, be a human being. So when you go back to your own high school, 35 years later, and you're going to try to write about a person you experienced for the first time at 16, you say that, um, when I look back now on what first drew me to Volpe, I think that I, was, I love to hear him talk. Sentences and whole paragraphs seemed to flow extemporaneously, organically. He seemed literary, to the extent we knew what that was, but not spellbound by his own voice. His 
naturally as his words poured forth, they stopped and he asked what we thought. I still remember the simple question he asked me not long after I started this class. Has anyone ever told you that you're a good writer? And in fact, to that point, no one had. We had written this paper on Billy Budd, which is a book you really didn't understand, but thought you should try to make some sort of trenchant point about. And uh, God knows what it was, you said, but he had applauded your effort and encouraged you. So he is the person who in many ways not gave you permission, just gave you an idea that this might be something that was a talent of yours that you could explore. I do think we've all had that transformative moment, or if we're lucky in the teacher. But to go back 35 years later, you are not that same person, and neither is he. And so how did that present both opportunities and challenges in your relationship with him, in which you were going to tell his full story? not just the pieces of him that might be recognized in an award or an accolade on paper? Well, the first hurdle for me was, you know, when you're 16 or 17 years old, you see the world as a 16 or 17 year old, and even if you think you see it very well, there, there are limits. So the first thing for me was, I hope he's as remarkable as I remembered that he was. And, uh, and that was a, a really good discovery for me because I, he was. And I still loved to listen to him talk. And he was actually more remarkable because he had, had grown, you know, many decades. Um, but then there was the reforming of a relationship, you know, as two adults, because he was 24 years old, 25 years old when I had him. So now we're almost like the same age. I mean, we're six years apart in age. So there was that. And then there was also, um, you know, when you have somebody you're writing about, you know, sometimes people are uh, halfway in, sometimes they're three quarters of the way in, and when you ask someone to trust you, say, I want to write about you, and I want, about, I want to write about you in a very deep way, um, you, ha you have to hope that they're all in, and you have to hope that when they say they're all in, that they're not back and forth, and I was very lucky that Lou was all in. He was hesitant at first, but then he was all in. And there, as you know, there was an aspect of, of Lou's life. Um, when I had Lou, Lou was uh, married and he had a child. Uh, 15, 20 years after I left his class, um, his marriage came apart and Lou came out as gay. Well, this had to be a part of the book, not for its Purian interest, but because I want to write about the whole person. And, you know, because I grew up when I did and my relationship with him was from the 70s, uh, he didn't come out and say that, Michael, my life has changed. It just, you know, this was back when it did change. It was just sort of assumed that we had never really had this conversation. But in our first time together, he just spoke. And I think he knew he's a very smart man. He's a very perceptive man. I think he knew that, that this, he just spoke very openly about it, very openly, and it wasn't something that was difficult. It did become difficult in the writing of the book because I had to think about, well, what does this mean in this sprawling book with many different strands that are about a town uh, that, has, that has sort of gone to seed, about what it means to be a teacher, about what, a, what, a, what, a, what it means to be in theater, you know, all these strands with this one man as the central character, what did this part of his life really mean to the book? And that was a struggle that, that I didn't feel like I fully conquered, if I did fully conquer it, until, until close to the end. I think John talked about that a little bit last night, about how you have to sometimes work things out on the page when you sit down to write, and that you often have to negotiate that relationship with the people you have become immersed with, which you know you may at some point reveal parts of them as you see it that they might be uncomfortable with. So I think that's an interesting thing. I would encourage those of you who want to ask questions to come to the mic and we can start to talk about this a little bit, a little bit too. I would like to ask you a little bit about negotiating that with Lou and then with these students who you talked about their lives warts and all and in newspapering, at least in my organization, we demand reporters get permission from parents for 
young people we interview under the age of, well, it used to be 18, now we say 16. We won't quote them because we feel that they're not really able to give informed consent. So you were dealing with a lot of young people and also ones who are not necessarily publicly savvy. So how did you deal with that, with them? The publisher, which, which is Riverhead, which is, was part of uh, Penguin, it's now part of Penguin Random House, um, they wanted me to get a release beforehand uh, from these students. And I actually resisted. Um, because sometimes when you're writing a book, um, people naively think that there's a tremendous amount of money in books. <laughs> Writers don't usually think that, but, but uh, they think there's more money than there is. And, I, and, and selfishly, I didn't want anybody to sign something and think, oh, there's a book. And I mean, they knew it was a book and they knew very well what I was doing, but I just didn't want to have that relationship at the beginning. So I said, let's wait until, you know, well, let's wait until the end of this. And in the end, actually, we never did have releases. There were some parts of the book that I, and just a few parts that I felt were um, sensitive and, and I asked about, I asked specific kids, do you mind if I write this about your family? And there were maybe a half dozen to a dozen of those. And in only one instance um, did I have somebody tell me they didn't want it and he went and checked back with his father. It was about somebody's, believe it or not, somebody's truck being repossessed in the middle of the night before a performance and him being up all night um, while there was this ruckus outside his house because his father's pickup truck was being repossessed. And that was just embarrassing to the family and I said, fine, you know, that doesn't make or break my book. I can easily, I can easily take that out. And I've thought, about, I've thought about this because in the community that I live in and that we live in, Bethesda, Maryland, uh, which is an educated community where people are very, uh, what's the word, protective of what they have and, and who they are. I think this actually would have been more difficult because people would have been very attuned in the beginning to how their families and how their kids were being portrayed. They would have been afraid, well, what if the college, what if Brown reads this? What if Harvard reads this? And they see my kid in there and uh, whatever. And, and I, it would have been much more difficult. This was a, a powerless, these were people who felt powerless. Uh, these are people who, whose lives were not going that well. And, but they weren't like really utterly poor either. You know, they were really a sort of a forgotten group of people who felt voiceless. And uh, I think they were really happy that, that, that I was there to give them voice. And I think they felt that way when I arrived, and I know they felt that way after I, after I left, even though there were things in there that, that people wished were not in the book, but, but nothing so much that, that, that caused the problem. Well, I think you've touched on an important point, and it would be a good one to open up, I think, to the group as well, which is one of the most important qualities of being a writer and being a reporter is you do have to listen, and you have to engage in a conversation. I mean, I think a lot of times, particularly when you're just starting out, you very carefully prepare your questions. Where were you born? Check. How do you spell your name? F-I-S-H. Check. You know, and you, and you run down this list. And when you do that and you hew to that too closely, you miss an opportunity to be engaged in a dialogue, which I always think is frequently far more revealing than necessarily going down that list. I mean, you have to prepare, but you have to be also open to listening to understand where you're going next or where you can go. I think that's the hardest part for a young journalist because I remember how uncomfortable I was in the beginning because I often felt, especially if I was dealing with people who had some kind of an important job, they were the city manager or the, the town councilman, and I remember feeling so strongly that I was a visitor in the adult world and that they knew it. And, uh, and I was this kid with a notebook and I was asking questions. And you know, the hard part about that is there's a large element about that that's true. You know, you're, you're groping your way. And uh, I guess I don't know exactly the solution to that groping, it's part of the process. I mean, one of the solutions is, you know, have your 
fax right going in, be professional, wear whatever clothes you're supposed to be wearing, you know, whatever it is. Um, and it, but, you know, one of the great things about what we do it now and, and as you grow and as you're able to do different kinds of stories is you can bring some age and some wisdom to this craft and, and you feel like you understand people a little more. You've, uh, you know, you've, you've gotten married, maybe you've had a family, and I know this is all, you know, down the road for you guys. Um, but, but every experience that you have as a human being, you know, every single one, the good ones, the bad ones, the mistakes you've made, you know, they all make you better at, as, a, as a writer and as a reporter. And therefore, when I now, you know, you talked about, you know, having just a conversation, um, I feel like, as you do in your work, you feel like you're, you're able to have that conversation because you have the basis for it. But I guess the other thing I was at is, you, you don't have to wait, you know, three or four decades to feel that comfortable. <laughs> you, you do get there, but you sort of got to get a little, you got to get over the part about, you know, I'm, I'm just here and I'm asking the questions. You know, a colleague, uh, a colleague of, of mine, um, who, who Gene Foreman worked with at the Enquirer and is a, a vaunted uh, and, and uh, now late foreign correspondent and political writer, Richard Ben Kramer, who I was lucky enough to work uh, with in Philadelphia. He was at the Enquirer and I was at the Daily News in Philadelphia. And I got to know Richard. And uh, Richard said something to me really meaningful very early on. He said, try never to ask a question. Don't ask a question or just op ask open-ended questions. Now that's really hard to do if you're gonna go to the town council meeting and you're gonna say, now what was that budget figure again and, and what's the millage and you know, all that stuff. But when you're interviewing somebody on the street uh, and, or you're interviewing a family or you're, you're writing about somebody's life, it's possible and it's a great goal to have. Just have a conversation. And uh, it's, it works, it really works. I think in some ways too, don't you find that there are um, two kinds, in, a, in a, a very broad way, two categories of people you interview. There are people who are practiced at having an answer and polished. Um, when you were dealing with this university, you were consistently trying to get an answer from official quarters and were consistently stunted in that. So you are trying to get answers from people who don't want to give you answers at all, and are very protective. And then you are sometimes dealing with people who are really happy you're talking to them, and so they'll tell you everything, sometimes you know TMI everything, and then you have to worry about how much of that you're going to include. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Um, when I worked in Philadelphia, you know, sometimes you'd go out on the street with a notebook and you'd be taking notes and you'd be about 20 minutes into your interview and somebody would say, is this going to be in the newspaper? And you'd think, well, yeah, that's why I'm standing here with this notebook. Um, so there are levels from, you know, the very naive to the very sophisticated. And I do think when you're dealing with the very naive uh, and they're not public officials, I think sometimes you have to take care. I mean, my, I've never felt my role was to trip people up and catch them at their worst. Uh, I think my role is, is to get a story, and especially when people are on you know, the other side of that equation. Do you think that can be a challenge? Well, it is because you're selfish about your story, mm -hmm. and you want as much in your story as you can have, and, and, and sometimes the silly pe things people say, or the incautious things people say, are the things that are gonna be the best part of your story. Um, it just depends who you're dealing with. Uh, if it's a politician, uh, I think you can hold people up to ridicule. If it's someone who you've asked to invest with you in your story and say, I would like, I would like you, know, you to be part of the story, I think you have to take some care. When I write profiles of people, and that's, I wrote a, I wrote a profile of the former president of this university, Graham Spanier, a few months ago. I've written a profile of uh, Oscar Pistorius before his incident, but that's sort of been my stock and trade uh, at the New York Times Magazine, one of my stock and trades. And I've always go in with a particular goal because you ask a lot of people. You ask for their time, you ask for their trust, 
Um, you ask them to take a little chance. And I always feel like when I write a profile, at the end of it, I want that person to read that piece and learn a little bit about themselves, learn something about themselves, or see themselves in a new way that they, that they may not have seen uh, beforehand. That's sort of a high goal, and maybe it's something that they don't always want to know necessarily about themselves, but I feel like, look, I, we don't pay people in this business uh, to cooperate with us. And uh, so that's just always what I felt is the little, the little gift that I at least try to give. When you are taking up other subjects or you are proposing a story, how do you come up with your ideas? Well, if it's a magazine story, uh, I want a central character. You know, I, I, with the New York Times Magazine, where the stories are, are seven, 8,000 words, sometimes longer. The only time that I've really, where it hasn't gone well, where the editing has been very difficult, or where I turn the story in, and, and an editor said, this is just way off, and it hasn't happened much, but when it has happened is when I've made the mistake of thinking, just because you have 8,000 words, the story can be about 11 different things. I think if you read very long stories in The New Yorker, or Vanity Fair, or the New York Times Magazine, you'll see that they're often really about one thing. There's an A line and there's a B line. The A line might be the person and the event, and the B line is sort of what it's about, you know, the, 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 the subtext about what this is really about. So I look for a story like that. I look for a story with a very strong character. I look for a story that, that, that matters. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't like to do things that, that people read and won't feel matters in their own lives in some way. So I, I do like it to have some import. Uh, when I'm looking for a book idea, I've, I've changed this a little bit. Um, and it's become a very high bar. I, for a book idea, I want it to be something that I wake up with every morning over the course of three years, and I'm happy to be doing it. Uh, and I'm happy to be spending time with I like the... that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm happy to be spending time with the people in that book. You know, whoever my characters are, you know, nonfiction is nonfiction, but you still have characters. The only difference is you didn't invent them. And when you're doing a book, you may live with them for two or three years. The book may take uh, two years to write and, and a year to edit, and then you've got, you know, your book tour or whatever. So these people become part of your life, part of your family. And uh, I'm just like drew a line. Like, I don't want to spend a couple years with a Pete Rose type figure anymore. Uh, so it doesn't have to be frilly, it doesn't have to be all happy, but it can't be just bleak. Now having said that, if, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe I will readopt bleakness at some point, but I, that's not what I'm thinking. A question from the audience. Yeah, I've got a question. Mike, I've got a question for you about something I think it, it's hard for young writers to, to work with, uh, but you see more and more in stories. Uh, the writer appears in the story. Um, and you just talked about the writer should try to be invisible, or maybe the reporter should try to be invisible, but um, how do you approach putting yourself in the story? What, is your, what do you think your role should be in the story as the writer? How much I should be in there, for example? You know, as you know, traditionally in a newspaper story, you're, you know, a, a daily newspaper story, the model has always been you're invisible. You know, you're, you're, you're off stage, you're totally invisible. And there are, there are reasons for that, and there are good reasons for that, and, and I think that's appropriate most of the times in a newspaper story. You know, in a magazine story, uh, I'm often in the story, actually. Uh, you know, I was standing here, you know, in, in, in this room, or... I was in the car with the subject and we had this interaction uh, or that interaction. Uh, but I don't feel like I'm ever the story, I'm sort of the foil. You know, I never want to be the story, I want to be the person that's bouncing off. But I've also come to think that it's really reader friendly. You know, that person on the street that says, uh, oh, um, this is going to be in the newspaper, or after the story is written, the person who says, uh, oh, you were there, and as the writer, you feel like, well, of course I was there. I mean, couldn't you figure out that from reading the story? But, but people who read us don't always understand how we work. So if you put yourself in the story, you've just shown them how you work. I think you add some credibility, 
But it's a really fine line because uh, I think a lot of people think like the I word then means it's about me and this is, this is how I felt or this is what I did and you know, it's, it's almost never about that for me. If I'm there and I've made a comment or I've made an observation, I put myself in the story, which is true in almost every magazine story I write, it was much more true in Drama High where 15% of Drama High is, is memoir and that's as close to memoir as I think I'm ever gonna get, but still, in a book, that's, that's 30, 40 pages or something. Um, but still, I don't, I don't see myself as some, somebody who needs to be, who, who needs my story told in, my, in, in what I write. But I think it's really useful. I think it's really useful. It'll be interesting to see where it goes, you know, over this next generation, because we have a whole generation of people on social media uh, and, and who are used to stating their thoughts and, and being really, and their feelings and, be, and, and posting their pictures. And uh, in journalism, we don't do that. Uh, and I think that our generation was more comfortable not doing that because you were raised, uh, you were raised that way. You were raised in classrooms where you very rarely got up to the front of the class and spoke. I mean, it was, uh, you know, as John uh, said a couple times yesterday, uh, you know, get off my lawn. You don't, I don't want to sound like an old man here, but we were raised you know, we were raised a different way to recede. And that really fit nicely with newspaper stories you wrote in which you're invisible. The future of long form journalism um, is bright. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's, I think, uh, <coughs> As, again, as John said yesterday, I think it's a lot better than it was 10 or 15 years ago. I think that the newspapers who, uh, and USA Today was famous for this, thinking that what people wanted was bite-sized stuff. And, uh, you know, we needed to be short. And I think the newspapers have come to know and, and you know, that there's, there's not that much value in that. That there's, there's short uh, stuff all over the, the internet. There's short takes. Uh, so that, that, and newspapers have come to realize when they post long magazine stories from their Sunday magazines or when the New Yorker, you know, posts online, people, you know, we now know, people read through the whole story. And, and you know, or a lot of people do. And in pure commercial, uh, um, you know, money terms, they're also the kind of people that, that your advertisers may want to speak to. So that, that may be a factor as well. So. I'm really hopeful about it. Uh, I think we're wired as human beings, you know, maybe biologically or neurologically, to, to want stories. Uh, you know, from, from as long as recorded history, there have been stories. And, and stories, if they're good, and if they use the, the um, mechanics or the, the, the craft of fiction, and, and you're good at it, and you can get people to keep turning the pages or keep clicking, uh, people will read. They absolutely will read, and I think I think there's a greater understanding of that now. Yes, I do have that same answer. I'm very hopeful about the future of long-form journalism. And in some ways, I think it gets better with each explosion of information, kind of like a fire hose that's on all the time that people can't quite drink from. I think people look for stories that help them make sense of their world and make meaning. What we see, and I do a lot of our long form work at the Washington Post, and we do quite a bit of it. I think we've always been known as a writer's paper, and um, other, other publications sometimes think of us as indulgent, but we've tried to think that we give people an opportunity to do that. We can see now with these metrics, it's gratifying that people will read the entire piece. We, get tremendous traffic from those stories. We can see how long a person is engaged on that story with the average engagement. And one of the things that's been um, kind of an interesting proof of this is we have a longtime writer and editor associated with the Post, Dean Weingarten, who has won the Pulitzer Prize twice for feature writing. And I am, in many ways, the queen of archives at the Washington Post. I want to surface the work we've done before. And I find that virally that happens. So 
Jean, in 2009, wrote a very affecting story about a man who absentmindedly left his child in the car when he got out to do something else. And the child died in the heat. And he was arrested and was going to be prosecuted for this. And Jean, who himself had once almost done this with his own daughter, instead of looking at this man and saying, oh, what an idiot, what a criminal, who does such a thing that person should be locked up, wanted to figure out how the brain works, what it is that might happen to do that. And he wrote this really affecting and amazing portrait of this man and the anguish he experienced and the court system grappling with it. So this past summer, we had a number of these incidents. And every time someone anywhere in the country had left their kid and was arrested, we would see this upsurge in this story of genes without even having to tell people about it. So in the course of the summer, there were another two million pages for this magazine story, which had been written five years previously. Um, and he did another famous story kind of like this. It's kind of a gimmick of a story in which he put Joshua Bell, who was a noted violinist, in the metro and had him play as a buster and watched if anybody noticed that they streamed by that this was just an ordinary buster. This was an incredibly accomplished violinist with, it sounded like a pretty damn good Stradivarius violin. And, and, he, and he wrote about that. And so um, sometimes we go back to try to understand our metrics and we say, Pearl from Four Swine, what happened? Is that the 200,000 page you said? What's that about? And we kind of go in and we say, did it come from Reddit? Was it, was it Twitter? Or what was it? And we can't always figure it out, and it's complexing, but at the same time, it's wonderful we can't figure it out. There's some serendipitous <coughs> connected tissue out there that we don't understand, but I do think it underscores that great stories find their readers who are hungry for the most one over again. So I feel good about that. Yeah. Um, you can protect sources, I mean, young people, when you're interviewing them. What do you do with their Facebook stories? With the what? With their Facebook stories. Oh. Um, I can't say, I know this is an issue, I know. Uh, I can't say that I've run into it a lot, personally. When I was writing this book, uh, I was on, I was Facebook friends with, with some of the students, and it informed me. You know, it was a way for me to know something more about them. In only one case did I use something. I used a comment. There was a boy in the book who was like the golden boy. Uh, he played it. He played that part in the play, and he was that uh, in a play that I followed, and he was that in real life. And I plucked one thing off his Facebook where someone had made a comment to him uh, that reflected what a golden boy he was. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's one of those case-by-case -case things. I wouldn't feel, certainly with minors, I wouldn't feel empowered to just, you know, rip quotes from their Facebook. You know, if, if someone's committed a crime, if, if, if you're chasing a news story, obviously you're going to use what you see and you're going to, then you're going to, you know, you're going to talk to the newspaper's lawyers or you're going to talk to your editors. It's a different equation, but I, I don't think there's open season on that. On the other hand, it's there and, uh, and you should use it as a writer because it, it gives you a window into, into somebody's life. And sometimes it can be a deceptive window, but it's a pretty wide window also. You know who their friends are, you know what they care about, uh, you know how willing they are to, to say stupid things that might not be who they are, but if you're just like putting it all out there and you're you know, in the pictures with, with the keg and you're 16 years old, well that, that tells you something, right? I can tell you that we don't use it without re-interviewing. We use it mostly as a target to report it. If you can see some portrait that is beginning to emerge, it gives you a reporting target and what I like to call a theory of the case. Can you see some motivations? Can you see some things like that? But we don't pick up those quotes and run with them as central to anything we're doing. So you wrote this profile story on Graham Spanier. Um, I imagine there was a lot of trolls and people that commented on it afterwards that gave some negative feedback. How do you deal with that and not let that reflect on yourself as a writer? 
It's a great question because it's something that, you know, we used to get these things called letters to the editor and uh, they, they trickled in and, you know, your, your, your older, more responsible editors would, would weed out the, the, the really, you know, crackpot letters and it was all very polite and last century and now we have comments that are, that are often not polite. So the first thing I would say is you have to have a thick skin. You know, you really have to have to grow a thick skin. It's like your byline is on the story and you've chosen to be in this field and you have to be a big boy or a big girl and just just say, okay, you know, that's, that's the arena that I've entered into. On the Graham Spanier story, I will say that, that I was stunned at the comments in the New York Times and there were I don't know, seven or eight hundred of them, and I think there would have been more if they didn't cut them off at some point. And you know, we have a reputation as a, a somewhat left-leaning paper, or at least that our readership, the New York Times, is a pretty liberal readership, and I, and I think that's true. And I was stunned at the comments. Uh, and uh, first of all, I was pleased that my editors liked the story. They liked it very much, and writers who I respect liked the story, and that was a really good thing, because a lot of readers didn't like it and uh, at least the ones who wrote. And what I found is that they were people who were, seemed to be very willing to convict and jail someone who hadn't even had a trial yet. And that just like floored me. It's like, wow, this is the New York Times and, and our uh, liberal leaning, uh, uh, you know, people who care about civil rights. And, but uh, that just to me said something about the charges, which is you are, connected to a child abuser, therefore we cannot even listen to anything reasonably because we are too freaked out by the, the horrid nature of this crime, which you have been rightly or wrongly connected to. But I think that was one of the first times that the comments, they didn't bother me and that I, and that I felt badly about myself, but they really did open my eyes and I, I was shocked by them in that case. hand back here. One. Hi. You mentioned that you dove into the drama high story.